To give people a picture, you've seen Borat, right? Yeah. That is literally where I'm from. Like, like imagine that, uh, you know, every single stereotype you can think of, literally that, you know. Uh, the most the most I got to, so a lot of people talk in terms of revenue. Um, in terms of most I got to in dollars, uh, so around 150,000 pounds, $200,000 profit in a month. So yeah, when I was 18, I made my first million, uh, not pounds, pr uh, dollars profit. And yeah, it's just kind of built every year since. Money doesn't make you happy. But go experience that for yourself. You know, you get tricked enough times that you learn that's the case. Go make a ton of money, right? Go fulfill all of your hedonistic desires. Then look at your life and assess what is important to you. Today we're heading to central London, Knightsbridge, one of the many homes of the rich and the famous, where million pound homes are a commonplace. E-Man is a 21-year-old self-made millionaire who started his business empire at the age of 16 years old, providing social media management services for brands at the start of the social media wave in 2014. Since then, he has amassed over 160,000 subscribers on YouTube, sharing tips and advice on how to create your own success. After numerous requests from aspiring online entrepreneurs, E-Man realized that his audience wanted more, so he launched Grow Your Agency an e-learning course that teaches students how to set up their own digital marketing agency. Retailing at around $2,000, Grow Your Agency has already enrolled over 2,000 students. Eman doesn't give many interviews, and to be honest, with the amount of followers he has, he isn't short of the attention. However, Eman has agreed to sit down with us at his home and walk us through his journey so far. We're going to find out more about the person behind this growing YouTube personality. E-Man, welcome. Listen, thank you first and foremost, thank you very much for sitting with us and finding the time to have this conversation. Um, I'm surprised you're even here because I saw you <laughs> in South Africa like two days ago, three days ago. So I saw you were here and I thought let me locate you before you fly away again. So thank you for taking the time. Now, before we start, I want to be very clear with you. This is a conversation, so there's no right or wrong. It's more about understanding the mind behind Iman Gadzi. Um, and really just getting people to understand kind of your philosophies and thoughts and how you've got to where you are today. So without further ado, I just want to be very clear with you that mm. this is a conversation. So don't overthink anything, all right? Well, I mean, hey, if we can have one fifth of the conversations we've had off camera before. Um, yeah, if we can have 25% uh, of the level of depth today that we did when, for example, we were at that cigar lounge, then I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll create some magic. Thank you. So first and foremost, Iman. You know, you were born and raised in Russia. How did growing up with your grandma in Russia mold and shape you? Well, I mean, here's the thing, you know, I, I came to London when I was four years old, so I wish I could say it was a larger part of my life. Uh, you know, when I think about my childhood, it's, I primarily think about it in London. But um, yeah, look, at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, it did shape me. You know, I grew up uh, single mom, uh, you know, biological father out, out of the picture, you know, before I was uh, born. Um, and, you know, single mom, 23 years old, working three jobs, um, you know, and my grandma, I, I was so lucky, a very loving grandma and grandpa. Uh, you know, the thing is in Russia, uh, to give people a picture, you've seen Borat, right? Yeah. That is literally where I'm from. Like, like imagine that, uh, you know, every single stereotype you can think of, literally that, you know, uh, my grandma's uh, house built, uh, you know, with his own two hands by my grandfather. Um, and you know, <laughs> if you wanted to go to the toilet, and this is especially scary when you're when you're that young, uh, you know, you leave the house, um, you take a right, you take another right, and you go down maybe like 15 meters past the chickens, past the cows, all the crops, and then you go into one of those like little Turkish toilets. You squat, you do your thing, and um, yeah, you know, it's. I feel very very lucky. You know, I look at a lot of children uh, growing up. Um, you know, especially with everything going on now. You know, uh, in mega cities and this and that, like. You know, for me, I was able to roll around in the dirt. I was able to uh, play with animals. I was able to play with other kids, fall, scrape my knees, be around nature. Um, you know, I wouldn't have had it any other way. Do you remember much about your grandma? Yeah, a lot. Uh, very, very, very strong woman. Um, still is. Um, and yeah, it's just, I, I think I've been very, 
obviously a absence of uh, a father figure in my life, but on the flip side, I've had such incredibly strong women in my life in the form of my, mo uh, my mother and my grandmother that it's, uh, you know, they really set a, a president. So when you were free, you made a, a transition to move into London mm -hmm. and what it sounds like was almost like a fairy tale mm -hmm. start of a story where your mom met someone in, and moved to London with mm -hmm. you. Tell me a bit about that transition. Yeah, so it's, I mean, you, you could probably, you could probably make a really uh, bad comedy movie about it because um, it's, you know, it's, it's this little kid from, from Russia who's used to nine black and white channels. You know, my mom uh, met my stepdad uh, probably 18 months prior. Uh, they met in Moscow um, when she was up there for some work. And, you know, they dated for 18 months at some point. You know, my mom left uh, and, you know, left me with my grandma and my grandpa uh, for uh, it was like four, four or five months. You know, they trialed living together in London. Finally ended up getting married. Um, so... I ended up, uh, you know, when I was four years old, I ended up coming to London, you know, basically going from a Turkish toilet to, um, you know, living in London. I went from nine black and white channels to 999 colored channels. Um, I went on a plane for the first time ever. Uh, and like, imagine just coming from literally picture of Borat, like, like that sort of village, going from there to London. And then even just the transition is in the sense that, you know, my mom met my stepdad. My stepdad was very wealthy. So I'm now coming to London and, you know, go, coming to London, um, eventually ended up going to private school. It was like, I don't know. It's just, um, it's literally like when Bora went to the States and he's just like, you know, he gets in the elevator and he thinks it's his room. And like, like I didn't know how to, um, you know, I didn't know how to, uh, behave i was just like so uh i was so unsophisticated and whatnot so uh yeah it was um it all it had all the makings to become a fairy tale story mm -hmm. you do mention a lot about your father being not present do mm -hmm. you remember just at that time during the transition what your thoughts were on his absence or or his presence yeah so um you know basically the situation was my uh real father was a uh, alcoholic abusive um so yeah, he was out the picture before uh, the time that, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm so proud of my mom for being brave enough to step away because, you know, a lot of women stick in there and I, you know, offer us for a long time she did until, you know, she had a, a baby on board and then it's, you know, you're not only thinking about yourself if you're uh, black and blue, um, you know, and, and beat up, you got a, a child to think about as well. Um, now, as I said, when my mom met my stepdad, it was, you know, he was educated, sophisticated, you know, had gone to Harvard, um, just probably one of the most well-spoken men. Uh, and to this day, pretty much the only person on earth I fear. Like, the dude is a, a psychopath. Like, you know, you meet one of these people, uh, some of these people in life, and they're just so charismatic. They're so, like, you know, um, they're so intelligent. You don't, you, like, you can't even fathom how intelligent. They know everything about um you know, they know everything about every single topic and hold a conversation with anyone. Um, but the dude was a very dark and twisted man. Um, so, you know, as once again, you know, for the first few years that I was here, everything seemed uh, okay. Uh, but, you know, very quickly after that, um, you know, so I remember some of my earliest memories. I was uh, eight years old and um, uh, I, I pick up the home phone and uh, I, pick, I pick up the phone, home phone. I'm like, hello. And, um, you know, the lady on the phone goes, Hi, this is London Escorts uh, calling for, uh, you know, uh, father's name. And I put the phone down. I talked to my mom and she's like, oh, who was that? And I was like, uh, oh, it was London Escorts. Like, <laughs> and I could see like a little bit of sadness in my mom's face. Uh, and I was like, I didn't exactly know what it was, but I, I could kind of get the, you know, I grew up way, 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 way too quickly. I mean, that was, everything was kind of fine until the age of six. But after the age of six, like, I just saw tons of stuff I really shouldn't have seen. I like was in a really weird situation. Um. And yeah, you know, I, I, I could kind of figure out what it was. And I was telling him, I was like, no, no, you don't understand. They like, because he was coming back from a, a business trip at that point. Uh, and, um, you know, I was like, no, no, to my mom, I was like, you know, you don't understand. Like, it, it, he's an uh, escort. Like, they escort him from, like, the airport to the house. Like, well, <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, long story short, I had this super weird childhood where, um, you know, my mom and uh, stepdad only legally ended up divorcing in 2019, right? So they were together 15 years. Now for my mom, you know, the main benefit for her was I got to go to private school, which obviously didn't turn out to do much for me in the end anyways. But, um, you know, 
it, I got to go to private school. Uh, but apart from that, you know, my, my stepdad didn't support us in any sense. He ended up cutting us off at like uh, by 2010, you know, um, uh, by 2014, 15, um, you know, my mom, by 2013 ish, my mom was, has always been super frugal and always very, um, long sighted, uh, you know, by 2013, she's working, you know, NHS minimum wage as a receptionist, did that for a few years, bounced around between different jobs at some point when things got really bad, uh, you know, we were on government benefits. Um, so I had this really weird childhood where like, I'm going to private school and then I'm coming back home and I live in an SW7 postcode, but I come back home and there's no warm water for the last three years of you know the time that we were there. There was no warm water, no heating, uh, and the last two years no Wi-Fi. Uh, I mean, literally, like you, the, my bedroom was was caving in. Like there was water leakage and stuff like that. So you know, I'm living in this technically three million pound house, but it feels like a fucking dungeon. Um, and you know, my mom and I are you know my mom's working. At, at one point, I remember she was working. Um, uh, you know, working at retail at, at Harrods, uh, once again, minimum wage, uh, they do a lot of temp jobs. Um, and, you know, sometimes my friend's parents would come in and see her. And I know for her, it was like, you know, um, for her and me, you know, like it, it, the kids that I, of the school that I went to, like, you know, people in private school can be very, very snobby and judgmental. And like, you know, um, people in my school were very, very, uh, me to my mom, um, you know, look down at her uh, a lot, look down at us, quite frankly, both of us, um, you know, and I know that she was just a very, very strong woman, uh, you know, for getting through that and uh, always putting her ego to the side and uh, just doing whatever it took for literally that 15 years. I mean, keep in mind, my mom is, you know, any other woman in that situation, and that, once again, I think it comes down to the culture that we grew up in. Culture we grew up in is you stay by your man no matter what. You know, um, doesn't matter if, uh, you know, my, my stepdad will only be in London three months a year, you know, the nine months he'd be abroad. And she's like, a man has to go do what a man has to go do. If he has business in another country, you know, blah, blah. And, and that's just kind of the culture that I grew up in. So, you know, it's a real testament to my mom. You know, she's a beautiful woman. Um, quite frankly, you know, um, uh, <laughs> she could have, she could have left, uh, within a couple years and, and, you know, found someone uh, 10 times better. But, um, instead, I think just kind of the culture we grew up in is divorce isn't, isn't, uh, as widely accepted as it is here. You know, it's, it's kind of looked down upon. It's, you know, you, you, you made a, uh, a, a, a holy commitment and, and you stick to it. Sounds like there was a lot of, um, highs and lows, mm. you know, especially from going from literally leaving, uh, Russia, Turkey, and mm. then coming to London and then having this new environment. How are you interpreting? In all of this at the time, how were you interpreting all these highs and lows? Was it making you introvert, extrovert? How were you? Yeah, so so growing up, it was it was definitely quite interesting. Uh, I didn't have many friends. <laughs> I didn't have many friends growing up. Um, you know, and I was very to myself uh, in general. I was very shy, um, and that was also kind of a, a byproduct of my stepdad. Like the dude was like, you know, I would um, like I'd. I'd be you know cutting with a knife and fork and i'm you know i'm six years old and also i'm coming from russia you know it's there it's a totally different story and i'm fucking gun with some cutlery i drop the fork i get kicked out the house like locked out <laughs> like like the dude was a psychopath uh um you know i remember one time i would uh he didn't like my handwriting so i literally for 48 hours straight, straight by the end i couldn't feel my hand uh for 48 hours straight i, I had to rewrite sentences in in uh you know uh, with better handwriting um so, you know, I think because of that, um, I was very just obedient and shy and basically the opposite of everything I am now. And maybe it was that kind of spring loading um, of, of that obedience and everything like that uh, when I was young that made me when I got to age when I was like 14, 15, 16 and kind of came out of my shell more. Uh, it was the complete, it was like, fuck you, I'm going to do what I want and I know what's best for me. Um, and, you know, you try to stop me. And, you know, by the time that I was... Uh, 14, 15, 16, you know, uh, 15 year old doing uh, psychedelics, uh, you know, um, uh, doing whatever he wants, you know, uh, by 14, starting my first business by the age of 17, dropping out. Um, I was, I went from being very, very shy and introverted to, as I said, by the age of 14, 15, 16, maybe that was, uh, maybe that was my little way of, of rebelling, um, just kind of going the complete opposite direction. This is all going on in the household and you're growing up during this time. As you said, you're exploring different things, you're 
exploring uh, Mr. Psychedelics. What part of this transition of just going from being a boy to being a teenager do you think you started to identify that you just were a little bit different? You, you, you wanted a little bit more. Where did you think, where do you think that that spark came from? Oh, I mean, so for me, it was, uh, I mean, honestly, from like the age of like seven, because I used to, um, I used to talk to God a lot, um, you know, and I always felt like I had a guardian angel and like my mom has always thought that, you know, uh, we've had a guardian angel. Um, so as I said, I was just really, you know, once again, I, I guess it was also just kind of my childhood, you know, when I was eight years old, uh, other eight year olds would be getting, um, you know, would be getting like Xboxes and like I, I got Mayor of Casterbridge. Uh, with the assignment of like, hey, read this and then write an assignment on it. Um, so, you know, uh, I'd be getting all the Dickens works. And, you know, so I, I actually enjoyed reading. Uh, you know, I, I remember actually actively asking, you know, when I was nine years old, 10 years old, I wanted Waterstones gift cards for my birthday. Like that's, you know, and I would spend a lot, a lot of time reading, you know, the amount of times my mom, I remember would be coming into my room at 2 a.m. and I'd be reading and she'd be getting angry at me because I had school the next day. So it was always, always a little different in that sense. Um, and then I remember from like the ages to 11, 14, I kind of got more into the things that other people got into. I came out of my shell, became a little bit more social. And then, um, by the age of 14, I remember uh, I, there was just one point I was just like, we are so royally fucked. Like, <laughs> I was just like, we are so fucked and I'm the only one that can do anything about it. Cause you know, stepdad isn't going to do anything. Uh, my mom, bless her, obviously kept us afloat, but you know, even from the age of 14, uh, it was a radical thing for me to say back then. Uh, from age of 14, I said, I'm not going to university, right? Age of 14, I was saying to my friends' parents, I was saying, and you know, for me, it was like, okay, I'm not going to take on student loans or debt. That's preposterous. Uh, and it's not like I have a family that's going to pay for it. So, um, yeah, you know, from the age of 14, I started reading, and I mean, I was reading a lot at any time, but I started reading a book a week, but in the self-development realm. Right, so you start off with all your your classics, your rich dad, your poor dad, your uh, thinking grow rich, your how to win friends and influence, you know, all of those sort of staples, right? And that kind of leads you further and further down the rabbit hole. And um, yeah, I read a book from the age of fourteen to seventeen, so four years from two thousand fourteen to two thousand seventeen. Uh, I read a book a week religiously for for those four years, and um, that was kind of uh, I believe that was the nucleus to everything else that was about to come. And I built up that account to around like 25, 30,000 followers. And then from there, I had someone message me and they're like, hey, can I buy your account? And I was like, fuck, like, you people buy other people's accounts? And then that kind of got me into the world of flipping Instagram accounts. So that was actually my first business back in 2014. How and old were you? Yeah, 14, 14, right? So that was my first business. And that was the first time I ever made a couple grand, right? 